I'm Dave Mergel and this is where we talk to thought leaders from the, around the seafood sector and influencers around the world and try and come up with ways to move the seafood sector ahead in North America. And for our first episode, I wanted to talk to somebody from the Food Service Distribution Channel. Why? Because food service is where seafood is heavily indexed towards. So the food service distributor is typically a massive, plays a massive role in this whole dynamic. And I thought we would start with the food service distributor and get some insights. What makes them tick? What's important to them? What are some of their insights? For today's conversation with our food service distributor, I chose the Chef's Warehouse. Why? Well, first they have a national footprint, so they've got great visibility in what's happening all around the country. And second, as a specialty food service distributor, they know brands and they know products. And also, their seafood division is run by someone who I consider to be one of the smartest people in the seafood business, Josh Berman, Vice President of Seafood Strategy with the Chef's Warehouse. I got to know Josh uh, and his dad, Rick. They both ran North Star Seafood, a food service distributor in South Florida, and they were my Schooner Bay distributor at the time, and they did a really great job. And as I got to know them, I realized how forward thinking and intelligent and also customer and consumer focused they were. Today's conversation with Josh was really, really interesting. A lot of great insights, a lot of great comments, and I think you'll find it interesting as well. Hi there, Josh. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Josh Berman, Vice President of Seafood Strategy with the Chef's Warehouse. Josh, tell me all about what the Chef's Warehouse does and what you do for a living. Thanks for having me, Dave. Um, so a little bit about the Chef's Warehouse. The Chef's Warehouse was founded in uh, 1985 as a dairy and specialty company, distribution company in, in New York, uh, Manhattan. The founders are two brothers who grew up in the dairy business. Their father were, was a Greek immigrant who moved, came to the U.S. Uh, and you know, started in the dairy business. And uh, one of the brothers, who's the CEO now, was a professional basketball player over in Europe. And he uh, saw all of these great products while he was over in Europe in the, in the 80s. And when he retired from basketball, uh, you know, it, the natural progression was for him to kind of go back into what he grew up in, and that was the food distribution business. Um, and you know, realized that there was a, 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 there could be huge demand for these specialty products. Um, you know, protein became you know the, one of the next uh, logical items to start adding to their portfolio. And fast forward, uh, you know. 25, 30 years, uh, you have a company that's what we like to call a specialty broadline company that focuses primarily on high-end white tablecloth restaurants and food service uh, um, locations. Um, protein has really become a large part of our business. And with that, on the protein side, you know, our products are, are really, really high-end. And so when you're talking about the beef world, you're talking about a lot of prime meat, a lot of upper two thirds choice beef. On the seafood side, you're talking, you know, our, our, our seafood distribution companies that became part of our business over the years are, you know, mainly doing fresh and keeping the highest quality products that money can buy. You know, you owned a distributor, you operated a distributor for years successfully. Uh, sold it to one of the biggest broadliners in America. But now you've made a transition to a company that's really, really focused on almost artisan products. So how is that? Have you had to, see, have you had to make sort of a, an adjustment in how you approach the sector? Our frozen, frozen products, our, our frozen portfolio of seafood um, is exceptionally well curated. You know, I like to say we, we have the Rolls Royce of, of, of all seafood offerings when it comes to frozen products. And most of those items are interestingly private labeled, um, you know, under a brand that we've created. In terms of the, 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 the pure protein companies, you know, I, I think some of the strategy that, that I've used in trying to generate business and leverage the companies that we have across the country is try to introduce some of those items that are not native to those those territories because everybody's always looking for something unique everyone's always looking for something different and so when it's always the same stuff you have it's 
kind of challenging to differentiate yourselves among the competition. And we have this incredible network around the country where I can get, you know, yellow tails from the Florida Keys on a truck, uh, you know, or a plane to San Francisco and introduce a product that, you know, may drive a lot of demand if we can really get some traction or vice versa uh, with, you know, rock cod in South Florida. Customers are, especially now in the pandemic, are so price sensitive because they're watching every single penny. Um, it's hard to find really fresh products that are a, you know, well priced and affordable for a restaurant or uh, you know any sort of food service establishment to be able to um, you know make profit. When you're thinking about your customers or what your customers want, how much is that driven by by that product? And, and how much is it driven by any sort of marketing uh, component to that? Or is it entirely the product? So I think um, our approach has been, we like to offer a good, a better, and a best. You know, uh, that's been our philosophy. We realize that not everybody can afford the Rolls Royce. Not everybody can afford the Mercedes. Um, but we hope that with the customer base we're trying to attract, you know, there they there's an opportunity for them to afford products that are in within reach to everyone that you're trying to sell to. But we have to take pride in everything that we sell, and we have to know that everything that we sell is up to a certain standard. So when looking at our artisan products, um, there is a certain uh, a level of of standard that has to be. Uh, that has to be checked or uh, uh, flushed out before we introduce it to our customers. So now switching gears a little bit, the challenge remains that our sector, the seafood sector, consumption has generally been flat for quite a, a long time. So tell me a little bit, are you bullish on the sector? Are you, I mean, you're in seafood. I would assume you, you see lots of opportunities. Um, what is your thoughts on that? What does your organization think about the role of seafood? Tell me a little bit about that. We are very bullish on, on, the, on the seafood category. We believe that our path to a billion dollars in protein revenue is heavily dependent on the growth of seafood. Um, you know, I think people more than ever are more health conscious than ever. And seafood is one of the healthiest protein uh, uh, proteins you can eat. And, and so, you know, we really feel strongly on the growth of the seafood category. Most of that seafood consumption is on the, you know, retail side, the grocery side. Um, you know, I think seafood is, is a challenge because it is not affordable. Um, when you compare it to the price of chicken, uh, even the price of beef or pork products, it's much more expensive. On our side of the business, the food service side, um, I think the seafood category is actually growing. I think seafood's been growing with food service. It's heavily indexed to food service. Leading into the pandemic, you were seeing annual growth almost to 5% on food service year over year. Retail was maybe a percentage point. And um, I think the challenge is how do you transition? And one thing that you said that really kind of struck me, and this was this sort of emphasis on pricing. And when I talk about consumer marketing, I think people say, well, it's a, you know, it's a story, it's a nice website, it's going to be packaging. But pricing strategy is, I think, a real important part of that consumer marketing mix. And I always argue, you know, I'm from the salmon business, so I always would say, you know, this sort of weekly pursuits, like it's almost a ruthless, obsessive pursuit of margin, really prevented the producer from having a strategic approach. And that is having a set price for a certain amount of time. And, you know, perhaps uh, it means you sacrifice some margin, but on the, on the upside, you're making a long-term relationship with the customer. And furthermore, you're giving the consumer that opportunity to try the product, enter it at a price point that's affordable for them. And, and hopefully they love the experience and continue to come back. So I, I totally agree. I think pricing is an important part of that. Switching gears for a little bit, tell me a little bit about you know, what do you like to see in a producer? I mean, what is your sort of ideal, perfect producer uh, for your business? You know, one of the challenges when you talk about seafood branding is 
fish is the last wild product that we as humans consume. And when you think about supply and demand, we know how much cattle is out in the pasture. We know how many chickens are in coops. When you talk about snapper or grouper, we really have no idea how much is out there when we're going out fishing. It's really hard to market a product that you don't know what the supply is gonna be like. Um, on, the on the farm raised side, I think like you said, it's really important for producers and uh, um, you know, marketing teams behind those products to really have a story to tell about the product. And you mentioned story. I, I think um, so much of, of why we believe in brands and why we align with brands is because we identify with what the story is behind the brand. Um, and not having that to, to anchor yourself to makes it challenging to sell it. And so I think that's one, you know, how, how is one brand or one producer different than everybody else? And everybody, you know, every company obviously needs to find their niche and those that do will be successful. Um, and those that don't will, will eventually be flushed out by those that are. And I think pricing is, is really important too. I think, um, you know, like you said, having set pricing is, is, is really beneficial, especially to the end user, to the customer, to the restaurant. Um, all, we see swings in pricing that, you know, you know, can have an impact on food cost that is really challenging for a restaurateur or a chef to, to, to keep their business profitable or keep their, you know, their, their dish profitable, whatever it may be. So in terms of distribution, I guess this is where marketing um, meets distribution is this sort of developing evolution of e-commerce. I noticed that on your, on the chef's warehouse website, there's a capability for consumers to go on and, and buy some of your products, have it delivered. I mean, is that a threat? Is it an opportunity? So uh, again, like when you talk about e-commerce, e right, it's, it falls into two categories. I think our, our business to business e-commerce, where we're trying to make the shift from customers placing orders through sales reps or inside reps to going online and placing their, their order through our web portal. Um, but then you also must have noticed that we have a consumer uh, business that we put up online, which was something as a, I would call shotgun once COVID hit. Um, I think, you know, back in March, especially in New York, COVID was very scary. It is still very scary, but I think back then it was even more scary because we knew almost nothing about it. And we didn't know how you contracted it. We didn't know really what the impacts would be. Um, and as a result, um, you know, people got really scared and there was a, a, a run on the supermarkets. You know, products were basically short. You couldn't get what you needed, especially on the protein side. Um, and then furthermore, you know, this concept of, of e-commerce and, and delivery, you know, which has basically taken off over the last couple of years, did not, most of these companies did not have the infrastructure to support the sudden surge of people requesting home deliveries. And so when the pandemic hit and everything got shut down, we thought to ourselves, okay, we've got a warehouse, we got warehouses full of food across the country. We've got trucks sitting in parking lots, they're not rolling. Um, let's start getting food into, into people's houses. You know, like we can provide a service that, you know, really uh, helps the community. And so we overnight basically set up a online e-commerce site for some of our, you know, what we like to call premier products and, you know, saw a huge amount of sales in such a short period of time. Um, you know, over the course of a few months, things started to level out um, the, you know, traditional grocery companies started to do delivery better. And so we found our business retracting quite a bit. And, and that was, you know, mainly because we're not a grocery store. You know, we can't compete with Amazon and Whole Foods. 
right? They, they, they have an ability that we don't have. Our, our business model is dependent on large drops um, and high gross profit. So we realize that we have to really curate our site to be more representative of who we are as a company. And that really is a working progress. And, and we're still working through what our identity is. I think, you know, going back to what we do best, you know, although we are a broadline specialty and we have, you know, many of the traditional food service, broadline food service items, we do have the artisan products, but protein has become a huge part of our um, business model. And I think we do protein uh better than anybody else in, in the country. Now on the B2B side, um, you know, I think that just streamlines our, our business when a customer does not have to uh, call a, sir, a customer service rep or their sales rep to, to, to give them the order, then it has to be entered. You know, everybody's on their phone, everybody's on a computer. Uh, it just streamlines the entire process and makes it much easier for us operationally uh, to get the orders picked, get them on a truck, and ultimately get them delivered to, to the customer. One of the barriers for consumers is price, okay? Uh, so, you know, am I willing to pay more? You're going to see margin typically at the food service channel, and that's why I think one of the reasons, anyway, the seafood sector is more heavily indexed towards the, sea, towards the food service sector. But this is why I believe that we've got to start increasing consumption you know, in other channels and really starting to grow the volume side. That's why I sort of believe that, you know, marketing and connecting to the consumer and really trying to develop strategies to engage the consumer, get them to try new products, i.e. different seafood species, and really make that a part of their, consistently a part of their basket. And, uh, and so that's what I wonder. I wonder if perhaps we're, um, you know, we're focusing so heavily on this, you know, this margin equation that we're not thinking about how to grow uh, the sector and how to grow consumption. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a very valid point. I think that, um, you know, I was thinking about some of the questions that you, you know, you, you were asking about marketing and, and branding and the seafood business. And we do have to understand how we how we can drive costs down to reach more consumers. Uh, you know, one you know interesting outlier in our business right now that I think is trying to disrupt our industry is is Atlantic Sapphire. And I don't, I don't know how much you know research or, or how much you know about that company, but but ultimately you know they have to, you know made the decision that the best way to get salmon or they, they feel the best way to get salmon to more people's mouths is to try to produce so much that it brings the price down. And, and, and the over time, the goal of the, C, the CEO's goal is to bring the price of salmon to the price of chicken. And that's just being done through volume. But if people don't make ch take chances like that, the business is just gonna stay stagnant and you know we're not gonna have the disruption that we need to ultimately, you know, get more people eating fish. What is, what is the responsibility of the producer in your mind? What is, what, what is the, their responsibility to you and the customer? Um, well, I, I, I think they have the ethical responsibility to farm or produce in, in a way that doesn't impact, you know, our, our, our oceans and our environment, right? So I think that's number one. Um, Number two, um, you know, they are, they, they should be there to support us in selling the products, right? Because they are really the experts, right? We, we can do a good job of telling the story if, you know, we study it. I think that our biggest, our, the most success that we have is when we use um, the producers to go out and sell on our behalf. Schooner Bay did an incredible job in identifying the best suppliers in, around the country and aligning with them, not creating a price war for, for the item. And the support structure that they created was a great way for us as, as a company to hit the streets, to blitz the market, and to really get the product out there. 
but it really is important for the supplier, the producer to have a sales arm or a marketing arm or a ambassador that can help promote the products. Um, having that resource to go out and help sell the product, I think is an important part of the relationship. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go down a list of uh, sort of tactics and uh, things the producer should be delivering. Tell me if you think it's important, maybe a little bit important, not that important. Uh, packaging. Very important. Um, an e-commerce strategy. Mm, not, that, not that important. Social marketing, social and digital marketing. Uh, important. Uh, what about point of sale material? Very important. How about a brand story that's a cohesive story, consistently told, professionally told? Very important. Uh, distributor strategy? Uh, very important. Pricing? Very important. Uh, what about quality of the product? Uh, I mean, that, that, that's, if you, don't, if you don't have the quality of the product, we're not talking. So that, that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could go on, but I mean, you've said important to everything. And, and to me, that, that communicates that the, the best producer is doing all that stuff. And that's what marketing is. And I guess the last thing is just a connection with the consumer. How, am, how important is it to know whether it's the consumer or your customer? How important is it to know their needs? Uh, if you don't understand your customer's needs, you can't be a good supplier. Uh, I take a step further. You have to, and you, a great supplier and a great salesperson working for that supplier vendor can anticipate their customer's needs without the customer necessarily having to come out and tell them. I think that um, if you don't know, know, understanding and knowing your audience, depending on where you are in the supply chain, is the most important part of the business. If you can't, if you don't understand who you're, who you're talking to, who you're working with and what their expectations are uh, and their needs, then you're going to lose the customer really quickly. I think that's well said. Josh, I want to thank you for, uh, for your time today. Really great, insightful comments about the seafood sector, how it affects your business and your customer's business, where we can go from here. Josh Berman, Vice President, Seafood Strategy with the Chef's Warehouse. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Dave. This was great. Thank you.